In today's video, we'll be discussing the propagation of an action potential down an axon. After watching this video, you should be able to do the following three things. First, you should be able to understand how the action potential is propagated down an axon. Second, you should be able to determine how a perturbation, like a change in membrane capacitance or resistance, will alter action potential conduction velocity. And finally, you should be able to describe the differences in action potential propagation in myelinated and unmyelinated axons. Action potential propagation starts at the axon hillock, shown here. The axon hillock has a very high concentration of voltage-gated sodium channels. It sums the graded potentials that come from the synapses onto the dendrites in soma, which do not have the voltage-gated sodium channels. These voltage changes travel passively to the axon hillock, and if the membrane potential at the axon hillock is above threshold, an action potential will be generated, and then it can be propagated down the axon towards the terminal bouton. You can think of action potential propagation as similar to a stadium wave. So if you bring a patch of membrane up to threshold, you're going to fire an action potential. Some of that current is going to spread to the next patch of membrane, which will start to pull it up towards threshold, and then it will stand up and do the stadium wave or fire an action potential, and so on down the line. The action potential propagation speed or conduction velocity can be determined mathematically. But before we get to the equation, I want to go over a few quick things. Capacitance, or C, is the ability to store or separate charge. So here we have a capacitor that you might have seen in your physics class, and a capacitor can keep positive and negative charges apart. A capacitor is made of two conductive plates with a dielectric or insulating material in between. In the cell, your capacitor is the cell membrane. The capacitance is determined by this formula, where you have the relative static permeability and the electric constant, which we're just going to assume that they're constant for our cases. You have A, which is the area of overlap, or the area of your plates or membrane, and D, which is the distance between the charges and how far apart they are. If this is our axon here, and we have current or ions ready to flow, they can flow in one of two directions. First is the ions or current could flow across the membrane. Alternatively, they can flow through the axon or through the cytoplasm down along the length of the axon. The time constant can be used to describe current movement across the membrane. The time constant or tau is the amount of time it takes for the membrane voltage to get to 63% of the final value. It's a little easier to look at this graphically. So if we have membrane voltage here, and remember VM and EM are interchangeable, let's say you go from a membrane voltage of 0 to 100. If you then find the amount of time it takes for you to get 63.3% of the way to 100 or 63 uh, millivolts, that time will equal tau or the time constant. Tau is equal to the membrane resistance times the capacitance of the membrane. So it will take a longer time to get to your final membrane voltage if you have a high membrane resistance or a low membrane conductance or a high membrane capacitance. Similarly, we can describe the movement of current through the axon by using the length constant. The length constant, or lambda, is the distance along the axon where the membrane voltage is 63% of the initial value. So again, if we look at that graphically, your lambda is going to equal the length on the axon, so let's say here, where you get 63% of the membrane voltage change. 
So if you injected some current here and caused a 100 millivolt change, at this place, at your lambda length, you'll now be at 63 millivolts different from the start. Lambda is equal to the square root of the axon diameter times membrane resistance divided by 4 times the internal resistance, or Ri. You can calculate the velocity of action potential propagation by putting together these two time constants. If you think about it, if you want a fast velocity of action potential propagation, you want a small time constant. This will mean that you'll bring your membrane to threshold very quickly. To get a small tau or time constant, you'll want to have a low membrane resistance and or membrane capacitance. For the length constant, you'll want it to be large. This will mean that you're bringing distant reach regions of the membrane to threshold. To get a large length constant, or lambda, you'll want a large axon diameter, high membrane resistance, and low internal resistance. Putting these together, we find that the velocity is proportional to 1 over the membrane capacitance times the square root of the axon diameter divided by 4 times the membrane resistance times the internal resistance. So you'll notice that membrane resistance is in both your time constant and your length constant. Time constant, you want membrane resistance to be small. Length constant, you want it to be high. It turns out in the total velocity equation, you want membrane resistance to be low to get a higher velocity, which means that your time constant is winning out. For everything else, it's similar. You want a large axon diameter, low internal resistance, and low capacitance to get your highest velocity. Organisms have evolved two main ways to increase conduction velocity. The first is to increase axon diameter, and the second is to increase myelination, which decreases membrane capacitance. Myelin essentially adds on to the cell membrane. So you have either Schwann cells or oligodendrocytes that wrap around the axon with nodes in between, which we'll talk about soon. This myelin increases the distance between the plates or basically from inside the cell and outside the cell. So if we look at the capacitor equation, if you increase this distance, you decrease capacitance. Now be careful, the D that we're talking about is not the axon diameter. This is a separate mechanism. Myelin also allows for what's called saltatory conduction. So you have these nodes of Ranvier in between the myelin. Only at the nodes of Ranvier do you have the voltage-gated sodium channels, so only there can an action potential be generated. Once the action potential has been generated at the first node, the current will spread through uh, the axoplasm until it he hits the next node where it can bring that patch of membrane to threshold, cause an action potential, and so on. We can compare action potential propagation in a myelinated versus an unmyelinated axon. In the unmyelinated axon, each little patch of membrane must be brought to threshold and an action potential occur before bringing the next patch of membrane and so on. In a myelinated axon, action potentials only occur at the nodes of Ranvier, where there are voltage-gated sodium channels, and current is spread passively underneath the myelin sheath. The reason it's called saltatory conduction is because it looks like the action potential is jumping from node to node. In invertebrates, large axon diameters are the predominant mechanism of increasing action potential conduction velocity. For instance, the squid giant axon that we've talked about before has an axon diameter around 500 microns or half a millimeter, no myelination, and a conduction velocity speed of around 25 meters per second, which is quite fast. If we look at a human myelinated axon, like an alpha motor neuron or group 1A A alpha sensory neuron, that axon diameter is around 13 to 20 microns, so much smaller than the squid giant axon, although thanks to its myelination, it has a much higher conduction velocity, of between 80 to 120 meters per second. Similarly, if we look at a group 3 
a delta sensory neuron in humans, a very small axon diameter of 1 to 5 microns, a thin coat of myelination, can still give you a conduction velocity on the order of 3 to 30 meters per second. So on the top, the fast end of that range, you can get faster than the squid giant axon that's 100 times larger in diameter. As a last comparison, we can look at the group 4 or C sensory neuron fiber in humans, very small axon diameter of 0.2 to 1.5 microns, no myelination, and conduction velocities on the order of 0.5 to 2 meters per second. So as you can see, myelination can greatly decrease the axon diameters that you need and also allow you to increase or keep up your conduction velocity speed. That concludes this video. Hopefully now you understand how the action potential is propagated down an axon. Additionally, you should be able to determine how a perturbation, like a change in membrane capacitance or resistance, will alter action potential conduction velocity. And finally, you should be able to describe the differences in action potential propagation in myelinated and unmyelinated axons.